you everyone for coming this morning on this kind of a dreary, gloomy day, but we have a, a nice boat lake presentation that, that Sheldon's going to do. This is Sheldon Graber from Destination Yachts. Um, he's a Lagodi graduate. I went to school with him as well. When I moved back to Indiana um, from Minneapolis, I worked with Sheldon at Destination Yachts. Very interesting company, uh, amazing that something like that can be produced in a small southern town in Indiana. So. Um, thank you, Sheldon, for coming and taking time to do that. Well, as she said, I grew up here in southern Indiana, and uh, in doing so, I always thought I would move home. Of course, when I left high school in 1983, I said, I'll never be back here. And uh, you should never say the words never because here I am, so, and enjoying it immensely. So, uh, a little bit about the history of myself and the company. Uh, I grew up here in Indiana, moved to northern Indiana, I got into the marine and RV industry. And while working in northern Indiana, uh, myself and my brother had an idea that uh, his pontoons and my RVs, the companies we were working for, if we put the two together, we could make a great houseboat. And uh, truthfully, that's where it was, was dreamt up. Uh, we decided we would build a boat for ourselves, and uh, that was on a 4th of July weekend. And the next year, we were out on the lake in Lake Wawasee, if you've ever heard of that on the houseboat that we built for ourselves out of a bunch of uh, parts, kind of like the, uh, the song where the spare Cadillac parts. He got a bunch of marine stuff, I got a bunch of RV stuff. So as we were doing this, uh, one of my coworkers at Jayco RVs, which is one of the largest privately held RV companies in the world, uh, he says, you know, I think there's a niche market for those. So the three of us sat down and our initial business plan was, is we're gonna build two more. And our worst case scenario is, we each have a houseboat. <laughs> so as we started that uh, long venture, uh, we built the first one, got the second one done. I took the first one out to Ohio, showed it to a dealer out there. Uh, he loved it. He said, it's overbuilt and overpriced. I said, wait a minute, you love it. He said, I'm telling you, I need this. So he gave me what he wanted. We decided we could build that. We went back to Indiana, started construction on what he said he wanted. And we got it almost done and he drove out from Ohio and looked at it and he said, I want three more just like it. And that was 27, 28 years ago is when that started. And before he got back to Ohio, he called me back and he said, I want six. And I said, wait a minute, we'll build you the free three for the price we talked about, but we need to get through those three before we build the others. So shortly after that, Another dealer called, they heard about it, and a word of mouth spread, and we were in business. Uh, at that point in time, I was director of quality and on the senior management committee for Jayco RVs, and I had to walk away from that job because this thing just started consuming me. And uh, so as we built that company, three years into it, we were building about a boat a month, a little more than that, and uh, we got a call from Johnny Morris out at Bass Pro Shops, and he wanted to know if our company was for sale and Bass Pro Shops, Tracker Marine flew in in their little jet and two months later they owned a company called My Yacht. And uh, I packed my bags, moved to Missouri and started a manufacturing facility in Missouri building one houseboat a day. So we went from one a month to one a day in about a year and a half's time. And of course Tracker had 300 dealers at that point in time and they were just filling the dealers up. Uh, now also they thought they knew what they were doing and I tried to tell them but after I had like 60 or 70 boats out there in the field and the dealers weren't taking them they said wait a minute slow down we don't need that many boats they're not taking them and, and the, the whole process was is trackers theory is is we tell our dealers what to do which it worked great in most aspects but you can't tell the tracker dealer downtown Chicago that he's going to sell houseboats you don't have a market for it he don't have the equipment. They're not like just backing a bass boat into the lake. It's a lot bigger thing. So we went through some learning curves, but it was a really good experience at Tracker. I uh, got to know the people there. Johnny Morris was a phenomenal person to be around and see what he did. Uh, but I had a, a yearning to come back home and be closer to family. So on a vacation one time, I came back into Washington and was thinking about what we were gonna do. My non-competes and so forth were up with Tracker. And uh, in the meantime, uh, building was available, uh, met with the growth council in Washington, and they said they would do some great gap funding of what the bank wouldn't cover. Uh, happened to connect with a banker that knew what houseboating was. Uh, th these are all things that just kind of clicked together. 
And uh, so in the meantime, while I'm thinking about all this, I got a call from a dealer in Phoenix, Arizona that I got to know. And he said, Sheldon, I need a boat for the Phoenix show. And I said, well, Dennis, you know, we, we have a tracker dealer in Phoenix. I can't sell you houseboats. He said, I don't want a tracker boat. I want a Sheldon boat. He says, I know your non-competes are about up. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm not sure yet, Dennis. And he said, well, let me, let me send you something. I want to send you an idea I have. And uh, so I said, sure. And I gave him my home address. And the next day I got an envelope. There was a check for $50,000 in that envelope made out to me personally and you know your little sticky notes your yellow sticky notes said build me a boat and uh, three months later I was back in Indiana building boats uh, and that's been about 18 19 years ago so uh, kind of gives a, the, a little bit of the uh, background of how I ended up in Indiana one of the fun things that everybody always asked me when I came back to Indiana you know they'd come up and say who are you gonna sell those to around here and uh, we have sold a few around here, but our biggest market's been out west. Uh, we've delivered uh, boats all the way to Tabasco, Mexico, into the Netherlands, uh, east coast, west coast. We took some up into to, uh, Washington State, and they took them waterway up into Canada. So yeah, we, I mean, we ship them all over the place. We're working on a deal right now for six boats into the Keys, uh, a 10-boat rental home deal in uh, Amsterdam. They want us to try to build these things and ship them over there. A lot of that stuff is a lot of speculation, but you got to go after each one in case it does materialize. So, uh, and then we got what we happened in uh, 2008. Uh, 2008, the economy decided to just shut off for a while. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned through that process was, is up until that point, I thought we were indestructible. You know, we were going like crazy, couldn't, couldn't build as, as many as we could sell. And 2008 come along and we lost 60% of our sales. <laughs> One of the things in business today that I didn't know then, and I know now and have learned from that and love to share with people, be quick and precise with running your business. Because what I thought was, is, oh, it'll come back. I'll keep these guys working. These are all great guys. We'll keep them working. We'll keep things going and it'll come back. After about nine months of that and not coming back, I had a lot of overhead that went out the door that just didn't get covered. And uh, it, it really changed what you do. So, you know, my advice on that is, is pay attention to the economy and as much as you care for your employees and so forth, remember you're in business and make your decisions precise and quick with what you're doing. Um, use outside sources for that also. A lot of the times we get, um, emotional or you know set into our companies where this is our baby uh, it is but it's also your business and you have to make every decision whether it's uh, letting go a person that's uh, a close friend or laying off people that you know are great workers but you just cannot afford to keep them there hard decisions but those hard decisions are what makes your company stronger uh, fortunately I survived that my mistake and we're still in business um, Anyhow, the, the other thing about you know why I came to Indiana is the workforce is really good here. One of the things that we do is a lot of the different Amish shops and even fab shops around here, we can sublet our work to those shops. So as we go up and down in product, production, we simply order more or less from the cabinet shop or more or less from the metal fab shop. So you don't have all that stuff in-house where you have to lay the people off. You can keep more of a minimum crew. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I've got some pictures here and I'll just kind of describe what, what we're seeing here. Um, the boat in the picture there on the screen is being delivered to um, Phoenix, Arizona, Small Lake. Uh, two stories tall, there's actually a master suite and bath in the upper level of that boat. But the lake was limited to 55 feet, so he said, I can't go longer, so let's go taller. So we built him a double decker, it was one of the first double deckers we built. Uh, this is just some of the upper levels. A lot of the boats, the outside living is where a lot of the space is. So this is on the upper level. There's actually a bathroom in that little area with the TV and bar. Makes it real nice even on a rainy day, you're sitting under the shade and, and uh, enjoying your time at the lake. This is just some interior shots of them, I'm going a little bit higher in boats. The other thing our company did is when I, when I left my yacht, came back to Indiana, I wanted everybody to know the minute they stepped onto one of our boats, it was the next level up. And uh, we, accomplished that. Uh, uh, one of my friends that was also in the houseboat industry, they built a lot of boats otherwise too, uh, 
company called Playcraft. They were the second largest in the twin hull boats. And he came to me and he said, he said, I'm not sure if I'm going to thank you or what, but he said, when you came into business, it took all my business away in the houseboats. And I've been kind of happy about that, he said. But he says, you, you wiped us out because you went a step above us. And it was a compliment from him. And truthfully, he was tired of the houseboats and just wanted to focus on the go fast pontoon boats. And they've been real successful with that also. Uh, some of the features, interior stairways going up through the roof, uh, just custom furniture. Um, if any of you play pool, have you ever heard of Oldhausen pool tables? This was built for Butch Oldhausen uh, out of uh, San Diego, California, and that boat is on Lake Mead out by Las Vegas. And that was a new, it was an Elite Series. We kind of put some different glass on it, different shapes. Really, we're building a square box on a flotation device. But what our goal is these days is try to make that square box not look so square. And this was some of the first steps in that. Um, some of the people, this kind of reminds me of a deal. Everybody says, would you ever build a boat for any famous people? Anybody heard of Brooks and Dunn? Singers? Well, I built one for their preacher. <laughs> That's close. <laughs> And then Craig Jackson, I don't know if you guys, a lot of the guys or gals, if you're into old cars, the Barrett Jackson Auto Auction that's on TV, this is the boat we built for him. Got to know him, got to go to the uh, Barrett Jackson Auction, we had VIP, pass. that was a lot of fun. So, um, and here's the Hooters girls. We built this, this boat was built, this is their third boat. This is one of the owners of Hooters Las Vegas Casino. and. Uh, they bought a 35-foot boat from us. He called me a couple years later and said, I want to go bigger. We built a 45-foot boat and called me a couple years later, and that was his 55-foot boat. So, And this is, this is getting into our new, this one was just delivered in December this past year. This boat's 22 feet wide, 75 feet long, and uh, was at the million dollar mark. And it was delivered to a lake down in Atlanta, Georgia. And you can just you can kind of see it's just a whole different level of boat and you know completely hand laid tile. This is all some of the same boat. That's the master bedroom in a boat. So it's and there's the boat. So again, trying to get away from the square box. And we have one like that. If any of you are down in our area, we have one just like this being built right now. It'll be done in about a month and a half on the production line now. You're welcome to stop in. There's a night shot of it. Underwater lighting, all LED. There's another one again with some of the new styles. That's boat number one. <laughs> Thought I'd show you where we came from. That's, you remember, okay, so I told you that's the one we took out to Ohio and he said you overbuilt it, you overpriced it. That's what he wanted. So that is boat number three and we sold six of those to that dealer and that's what really put us in the market. So sale price on that boat at the uh, Ohio Boat Show, $29,995, 20 some years ago. Today I have a new boat that we went after that, that's the big one Atlanta. That same boat sells for $99,000 now. So, big difference in what it was. Okay. I'm going to try to load a little video here if it's if I can. Yeah, I don't believe it's going to work. No. Uh, anyhow, um, so you know, with all that, you know, some of the things that um, that I like to tell people about businesses and starting and stopping and getting into businesses, some of the key things to do is is how much does it uh, cost to turn the lights on? It's a little it's a little thing, but when you go to work, you, you, before you build anything, before you sell anything, before you do anything, how much does it take to turn that light switch on? I got to pay my rent, utilities, my overhead, my insurance. It's a very important number to know before you do anything else. Uh, knowing how much it costs you for your overhead, knowing how much you're making on the product. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, 
let's let's try to make 20% on that. I think that's good. Well, what is a true 20%? Is there factors? Is there waste factors? So, again, one of the things in the early days of the company, we would just go in and say, you know what, the market's going to bear this, and we think the bill of materials is going to be this. Let's go. It was pretty pretty loosely done. Today. When we get done with a boat, we can tell you within about 2% on an $800,000 boat, how much materials we have in that boat. And I can tell you exactly how many man hours are in that boat. Now, even though we quoted that boat, you use that history to go forward to price your new products. And again, um, in the industry, I met a couple of different people that owned companies and different things. And that was the biggest thing that was emphasized to me over the last few years. Know that you're making money and uh, it's hard to do and it takes a lot of time. Uh, I know my guys get very frustrated when I make them do the inventory or I say, hey, did you get this on the bill of material? Or I'll see a bill of material print out and there's seven zeros over here. You know, that's the, we didn't get that for nothing. Let's get it on there. So uh, relationships with your customers and your vendors. I'm just, again, trying to think of a few things to share with you guys. Relationships with vendors and so forth is good, but just as we talked about an employee earlier, you have to keep a little bit of a wall up there with your customers. As, as friendly as they get and as much as you get to know them, and I consider I have customers that are great friends, you have to keep a distance from them. Uh, it's a business transaction and you got to remember that. You, you, you feel guilty at a point because they say, hey, you're charging me too much for that. Well, it's really an easy calculation, you know, cost plus this, overhead's this, markup is this, that's what it is. Yeah, but that's too much. Sorry, you know, you have to keep that distance. So some of the things I've learned. Uh, legal aspects in the last couple, three years, we've had some people, uh, I had a couple people sue me and um, shared a little bit of this with Samantha and them the other day and uh, not used to that. You know, I've built 400 and some boats at this company and several others otherwise and never until the last few years gotten any lawsuits or people wanting stuff that I didn't think I could give them. And so I was on the phone with my, uh, uh, insurance man which is also an attorney and I'm, I'm whining I'm complaining I'm doing all kinds of things about you know this guy wants to sue me and I thought I treated him right da 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 and his name is Pat and Pat says Sheldon he says uh, how many times you've been sued since you've been building boats I said Pat this is this is the first time he said get off your high horse this is business today you will never satisfy every customer because there is people out there that that's the only way they know how to react. But in the learning process of that, what I did learn is, is this is part of the business that you need to put back to turning the lights on. You will have legal services that you're gonna have to pay for. You need to do calculations on those to move forward and to make sure you're making money. And uh, customer service is the last thing I'll talk about. You know, our customers, it's one of the struggling jobs, this uh, million dollar boat, we've made four trips down there just making sure he's happy, but he knows we come down and take care of stuff. Six hour drive, two guys in a pickup, it costs about $1,000 every time we send somebody down there. But he has spent almost a million on the boat. And he's already talked, two people are now looking at buying boats from us on that lake because they do, they do see us taken care of. So, uh, little fun stories uh, about the companies. Uh, we talk about business and knowing what money you make. About seven, eight years ago, there was a company out of Chicago. And I know the name is known, I, I won't use their name, but it's a consulting company and they come in and evaluate your company. And so what they do to try to get the door, they call you up and say, hey, we'll come in and give you a free day's consultant on any of the main issues that you have in your company. And if you like what we do, we'll take you to the next level and do more stuff for you. So this guy comes in, he says, what's your number one issue? And I said, cash flow. I, it's my number one issue. All right, so he's in there all day long. He goes into the accounting gal and gets numbers. He comes and asks me stuff. He's building spreadsheets and comes up. He gets done at the end of the day and he sits down across from me and says, Sheldon, he said, uh, I think I've got it here. I said, okay. He said, Sheldon, you don't have a cash flow problem. I said, what are you talking about? He said, no, sir. He said, that cash is flowing through here like crazy. You have a cash retention problem. So, you know, he spent all day telling me what I knew, but uh, it's just kind of funny on how he decided we, we didn't have cash flow problems. So, and another, uh, another funny story is, as you can see some of the pictures behind the trucks, um, got a phone call frantic from one of the escort drivers to call him. So I tried to call him back and I couldn't get a hold of him, couldn't get a hold of him. So I finally called 
the contractor that was driving the trucks at that point and I got a hold of the truck driver and I said, hey, the escort guy, Daryl, he said that he got some kind of situation. How's it going? What do we got, you know? And the driver says, oh, we're a little late to get through the curfew in Dallas and da 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 You know, and he just talked to me like, the whole time he was talking to me, the boat was wedged under an interstate bridge. <laughs> he wasn't gonna tell me, so, little fun story. So, that's a little bit about Destination Yachts, why I'm here, how I got here, what we do. I hope some of that information did you guys some good. And uh, any questions? Absolutely. Yeah. Great, great, great talk.